All right, folks. Greetings. Hello. Good Monday. Good week. New week. Um, we are in week week five of the semester, and it's also the second week of the second unit. Again, the second unit's focus is on formal and explicit persuasion. So last week we looked at logic and argumentation as the kind of the baseline of you know, how we might think about formal, explicit attempts to persuade audiences. Um, some really interesting stuff there from Wolbert that actually I think carries over to the stuff in today's reading. So this week is uh, the focus is on campaigns, kind of broadly speaking, thinking about campaigns. Um, obviously, we often talk about political campaigns. Seems like there's always some kind of election coming up whatever level, national, statewide, local. Um, and we also talk about health campaigns frequently in terms of, gosh, I mean, there's a bunch of them mentioned in this chapter here, but I'm just thinking like growing up, there's all these kind of messages coming from public sources about the do's and don'ts of being good member of society kind of thing. So this is uh, the final chapter from the Perloff book. Uh, communica communication, sorry, Dynamics of Persuasion, Chapter 12, Communication Campaigns, and it's a big, fat chapter, and so that's why we only have the one reading this week. Normally, I like to have two covering kind of a more broader range, but the chapter itself covers a fair bit of ground, and we're actually not going to go through all of the bits and pieces. Uh, there's a big chunk in here that's looking at actual cases of campaigns and kind of looking at some of their nuances and I'm going to move through that pretty quickly just focusing again usually it's the you know the important conceptual stuff it's some of the key terms some of the key dynamics some of the models that's the, the stuff we're interested in um, and I think that's probably good for a little intro so yeah so this is the second week next week we're gonna look at social movements that's where things get even a little bit more kind of loose right we're starting with logic we're moving to campaigns and then we're ending off with social movements and we're seeing things get a little bit looser things start to loosen up considerably in here especially when we get into diffusion theory but we'll get there in a second so um, Campaigns, communication campaigns, uh, we could probably think of a lot. When I was growing up, it was like, I think I mentioned this in a previous video, like don't drink and drive, don't have sex, don't smoke. What else? Uh, growing up in Canada, there wasn't a lot of messaging around guns because there's just a lot fewer of them there and don't have quite the same issues. Um, but a lot of, you know, just kind of settle down, <laughs> Don't be such hellions kind of thing. There was a lot of that kind of messaging. All right, so that's the kind of stuff we're talking about here is trying to influence behavior and attitudes at a mass society-wide level here. So, as always, here are the notes, um, and I'm just going to follow along here. Number one, campaigns are society-wide and hence complex. We're dealing with lots of stuff here, right? We're dealing with potentially anyone or everyone who is affected by the issue, whether it's health, whether it's... Um, usually health, isn't it, right? And it's related to mental health or physical health. It could have to do with safety. It could have to do with, um, I don't know, how we treat one another, kind of manners and that kind of stuff. Values, as uh, we'll see at the very end, is, is important and underlies, like, all of this kind of stuff. But we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, and uh, the, the first important kind of point of distinction here is that when we're talking about campaigns, we're not interested in advertising campaigns in the commercial sense. You often hear about the ad campaign. Nike has a new ad campaign or, uh, uh, you know, Coca-Cola has a new ad campaign. They're using polar bears now. It's part of their new ad campaign. All right, we're not really interested in for-profit commercial campaigns. They call them campaigns because there's several of them in a kind of a series, right? We are interested in non-commercial, not-for-profit. The phrase in this chapter is pro-social. I think that's a useful and good phrase to kind of get in there. Pro-social, meaning these are these are campaigns about improving society, improving the social fabric, the social dynamics between citizens. And so it's meant to help 
guide all of us together, right? Whereas commercial campaigns, more kind of private campaigns, might have larger effects that are actually antisocial, right? You think about, you know, cigarette companies advertise their product. Alcohol companies advertise their product. Gun manufacturers advertise their product. These are things that can be used in antisocial or, you know, negatively social kinds of ways. Doesn't matter. If you have a product and people are willing to buy it, we live in a society that says, hey, that's your choice with a few, you know, parameters there. But American society is known for that kind of free market mentality. If you can come up with the idea and if you can convince people to buy it, that's all good, right? So then the, the public information campaigns kick in to say, oh, hold on, chill out on the drinking. Maybe not so much smoking, right? Maybe slow down that fast, cool car you just bought. Maybe kind of slow it down a little bit. So they could be even seen as like antagonistic a little bit. Not to say that they're always at odds, but the commercial stuff wants you to buy things and there's a for-profit motive. It doesn't usually think too much about larger social you know, consequences. Um, so then we have the public informational campaigns coming along to try to uh, massage that out a bit. Now, in this chapter, number two, media become important. Obviously, if we're talking about society-wide campaign messages uh, or message campaigns, and if we're thinking about the question of mass social influence, um, media becomes important. Now, if you think about the kind of the history, the evolution of media back in the, like, 18th and 19th century, it was print, it was newspapers, pamphlets, maybe the penny press stuff, there's fiction. You can, you know, obviously appeal to folks through fiction. A lot of fiction uh, can move people different, you know, different ways. Uncle Tom's Cabin, whatever you might think about that novel, was hugely, hugely influential in its time um, on the slavery question. And uh, we see examples of fiction or entertainment persuading a lot as well. And in fact, in rhetoric, what I do, rhetorical analysis, we study fiction, we study films, we study. You know, I've been on a, a thesis, master's thesis about comic books, right? Because these things do, in fact, shape and influence, right? So media is important when we're thinking about uh, campaigns and how they are delivered, right? So we go from print, and then radio comes along, and after radio we get television, then, of course, after television it's now the Internet, and it's now phones, and it's everything's very um, accessible, it's in our hands, it's in our pocket, um, now we have these new social media platforms that are insanely powerful. We'll get to that kind of stuff later in the semester because it's very tricky, but obviously it's hugely, hugely important, right? So media matters. Uh, first it was newspaper, da, da, da. Oh yeah, we can also talk about billboards. We can, you know, everywhere we go, there's signs. Graffiti might even be something like, man, eh, maybe we'll set graffiti aside for now. But, you know, there's lots of different kinds of messaging that we think. Just, just walk across campus and see how many times a campaign is trying to reach you, whether it's on the bulletin board in the student union or someone standing on the quad with a clipboard. Hey, can I have just real, real, just real quick, just real quick question. These are all parts of campaigns, all right? So they're diffuse, they're complex, they're society-wide, they're coming at us through different mediums, they're coming at us interpersonally, culturally, institutionally, right? We're talking about a lot of stuff here. Number three, the key unit for this, uh, the key theme for this unit is again, formal and explicit. So the quote is, campaigns reflect this nation's cultivation of the art of persuasion. It's a kind of uniquely American thing. It's uniquely Canadian too. I actually lived in Singapore for a short amount of time. Singapore is very much about like do's and don'ts. So you get lots of public messaging there as well. So it's not only American, but you can imagine certain countries where there's less of it. Um, maybe like China, maybe like, it's more about just this is what you're supposed to do, right? Um, as opposed to citizens kind of trying to persuade each other. In any case, um, they rely on argumentation, sloganeering, and emotional appeals. Right here I was thinking about Wolbert, those three levels. Um, so argumentation is the sort of top level that we talked about. Sloganeering, um, I get this in the end of there. So yeah, argumentation is logo, substantive, that's the open level. Sloganeering is that kind of middle level. 
um, authoritative, semi-open, we're dealing with the ethos, and the bottom level is the emotional appeals, right, and that's the pathos, motivational stuff. So again, Wolbert stuff is lining up nicely here with the different kinds of ways that uh, persuasion is trying to reach us. Yeah, and again, number four, the key theme is about systematic, organized efforts. Campaigns are deliberate. They're intentional. And as we'll see with these theories, they're very detailed as well, and they can be very sort of systematic in the sense of like phases. We're looking at different phases of a process, or they can be very detail-driven and then very strategic in how they're trying to reach certain audiences. We'll get into some of that. Um, but that's the, that's the theme of this unit, right? We're looking at persuasion in ways that are deliberate, intentional, systematic, organized, planned. A lot of resources and time goes into the, the preparation and the strategizing of these campaign um, efforts, right? And, and then we'll still see, you know, the, the complexities there. But these are really serious attempts to persuade large groups of people that we're talking about. Um, on 325, 326, please do put a big fat star next to that stuff on mostly 325. And uh, it, what is it here? This is the, the sort of the distinctions between commercial or for-profit campaigns and informational or public campaigns. I just talked about that a moment ago. But if you wanted a little bit more detail, this is good stuff in here. Like, what are we talking about? What are we not talking? What are the characteristics of informational and public? So go through those and take a look. Um, and then we get into these three major theoretical perspectives that kind of illuminate the, the process or what are we thinking about? What do we need to know? What need to be aware of? What's involved in this business of campaign persuasion? And as Perloff notes, there's one of the three perspectives or theories. There's one that's focused on kind of individualistic uh, concerns. And then the other two are interested in kind of the broader questions, right? And so... I've thrown down a few key bits and pieces on number six there. Um, the individualistic approach, the psychological approach, is really thinking about what's going on inside any given individual in terms of will this message land? Will this message be received, right? What does it take for any given individual to accept and to alter, to accept the new kind of reality and alter their behavior accordingly? When you think about, one of the things I've added in the notes here is toward the end there is to try to think about the theory of human behavior or the philosophy or the portrait of human behavior that's kind of lurking behind these insights about how persuasion works. Uh, I think it's quite fascinating and, and it seems to me that we're talking about humans as, for the most part, if not lazy, kind of selfish and kind of conservative and kind of for the most part, not terribly willing to just take on new habits, new actions, new behaviors, change their thinking in certain ways. It seems like human beings get to a place where they believe what they believe, whatever it is. Okay, I have my beliefs. When you have your beliefs on something, and I feel like I'm like this. I mean, it's like I've gone through the process of trying to think something through, and I feel like I'm comfortable with my belief on this. Once you get to that place of kind of like, okay, here I am, you're not inclined to just throw it all up again, right? Because it takes work. This is getting back to that cognitive dissonance stuff. It takes work to get to a place of kind of feeling secure in your beliefs. You don't want to be challenged on that stuff, right? If it's my belief that everyone has the free American right to smoke cigarettes and drink soda and beer and pot, do all this kind of stuff, then I'm not going to be easily persuaded that we should all do this less and less and less, and it's bad for everyone, and it's bad for the environment. Like, leave me alone. I have my beliefs, right? So the picture, the portrait of the human kind of humankind that lurks behind these, these theories, I think, is one that says always that question of, like, why? Why should I? What's in it for me? So there's a, 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 we are all, I think, inherently fairly conservative and fairly kind of like change resistant. Maybe I'm wrong. I think that's less true with younger folks. In fact, there was even something in here about like if you're trying to educate the, the youth on like do's and don'ts, try to get them before they hit like, what was it, grade seven or something. They're more open to, to just easily adopting. And then as we hit middle school, as we hit high school, we start to like crystallize in, in terms of like our identities and our beliefs and like what we've what we think is right and wrong, and it becomes more difficult, right? 
that old that for what is it you can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of thing like the older we get the more that seems to become the case not always of course but we're sort of talking in, in generalities here and probabilities um and so that's i think important to keep in mind whenever you are trying to persuade or understand how persuasion works there's always that question of like why what's in it for me w-i-f-m what's in it for me why should i right that's the implied question the reaction that most any given individual or group of audience members will ask if you're trying to get them to think differently, have different attitudes, do something differently. It's like, leave me alone. I'm busy, you know. So I think knowing that right off the bat is super important for any persuasive effort is that you've got to be sensitive to where people actually live. You've got to be attentive to who they are right now, what they are what they do, what they believe, what they value, right? And then, I keep saying this, you can't persuade anyone unless they're on your side. In order to move them, you've got to kind of move with them. you got to get them to kind of come with you. you got to form that connection, and then you can do it. So that reactance thing, do we already cover that? I think it's coming up. There's a kind of reaction, a reactivity, a reactance effect where, you know, if you're, if you're confronted with a persuasive message that's telling you to do something differently or value something differently, a lot of times we have this reactive thing of like, yeah, go, just the very fact that you're trying to get me to do something different makes me almost hostile, reactively, right, reflexively. Like, just because you're coming up, I'm a little bit like this myself. I'm like, I've spent a lot of time thinking my thoughts through and thinking my beliefs through. Leave me alone. I'm good. If you want me to think something differently, you're really going to have to work for it. And it's probably not a good way to be. You should be open. You should be receptive. You should be kind of like trying to always revise your thoughts and beliefs to make sure that they're good and sturdy and right and healthy and true and all the rest of it, right? Um, but I think we do all have that sense of like, no thanks, I'm good, right? What's in it for me? Why should I? And that's, that's important to be mindful of. All right, so... Um, we got the three approaches, and the first one's focusing on individual resistance or in what's going on inside in terms of like what it takes to actually get someone from the pre-contemplation to the contemplation to the action. And again, it's about being sensitive, and it's about trying to find them where they live and where they are most open and receptive to new information, new way of doing things, new values or whatever. You got to kind of hold their hand and coax them along kind of thing. Repetition is important, right? Just one isolated message, not probably not going to do it. There's a reason why we get the same, you know, spam email over and over and over, why the callers call our phones over and over and over. Repetition tends to work over time. It's not pretty, but it tends to work. And so repetition of a message... Um, is is one of the most classic ways of actually getting something across is just keep repeating it all right so b and c are the are the non-individualist the more macro focused uh theories there diffusion theory if you look on page 328 you'll see this interesting kind of grid and it's got inputs and outputs and it's got all these different variables right so diffusion theory is interested in how it is that campaigns spread or don't spread throughout you know a broad population based on a consideration of all of these different variables right and so in terms of the input variables we've got source message channel receiver and destination these are all kind of ways of breaking apart um the campaign itself right into its different parts and then in terms of output in terms of like what the campaign is is creating in terms of outputs in terms of you know change behaviors or not we have um, dependent variables including exposure, level of exposure, right? Attending to it, liking it, becoming interested in it, comprehending it, skill acquisition, learning how, yielding to it, memory storage, da da da. All these different kind of components, and you can you can draw sort of a portrait of any kind of campaign based on the different elements and the responses, and you know it's a pretty handy little matrix for thinking about a very complex phenomenon. Um, so on the top of 329 there, it says, Diffusion theory identifies a number of factors that influence the adoption of innovations. Innovation is a, you know, a campaign for a new thing, a new behavior, a new way of doing something. We should all recycle. 
What? What you, what's this recycling business? I still remember when recycling was like everyone was trying to get it going. It's like, what's, what do you mean recycle, right? I also thought it was interesting that in the diffusion stuff, uh, number, not number B there, it's a handy matrix, and diffusion theory places significant emphasis on the role of media, right? So how do you diffuse a message? <sighs> media works really well here. And it's also important that media is not just news media. We're not just talking about, you know, government messaging or we're talking about the public health ministry of public health sends out its campaign or whatever we're also talking about you know cultural efforts to do this right when private citizens come and make a documentary think about a documentary as trying to like get us to think differently about you know eating sushi or whatever right there's a lot of stuff out there like that and even fictional entertainment Television can move things. Film can move things. Um, and so, again, we're talking about this complex diffusion of messages. And um, it's hard to account for it all as a single campaign. But these different bits and pieces kind of echo and resonate messages. Um, and I should probably speed up here. So, social marketing is the third theory of... of um, campaign communication and this one is just sort of drawing on the the work the strategies the insights the modeling of just regular old marketing and trying to sort of apply that to thinking about pro-social messages right and so we have these five steps of um planning bringing in a certain theory conducting some communication analysis probably demographic analysis implementing a certain strategy that's tying all these pieces together and then evaluating and reorienting the approach. So again, planned, intentional, strategic, deliberate. Um, and those two theories, diffusion and social marketing, account for a lot of what's actually going on out there and how to kind of understand what's working and not working. But as Perloff notes many times, because we're talking about such a complex uh, idea, this idea of mass social campaign influence, there's no guarantees. I mean, there's never any guarantees, even if you're talking interpersonally with someone or even if you're talking with a small group of people that you think you know quite well. There's never any guarantees. There's always um, number seven on the second page. Actual effects of campaigns are hard to gauge in advance. Message recipients can easily be turned off by preachy tones, by overly aggressive approaches, by untrustworthy spokespeople or spokespeople that people just don't care for. Fauci took a lot of heat during the pandemic, a lot of people thought he was great. A lot of people thought he was uh, suspicious and and um, a lot of commentary on him as the spokesperson. Pay close attention to the list of recommendations on 337. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff there of like, basically, you know, try to do this or try to think about this. Understand the audience and tailor messages so they can congeal with the audience needs and pre-existing attitudes. Here I wrote in the column... What is the theory of human behavior implied herein? I think that would be a good question. I asked a similar question on the first test and about the theory implied behind that little box on cognitive dissonance and mental health, right? And some of you got that really well, I thought, with this idea of like the theory behind the, all of these notes is basically like go easy on yourself. Accept that you can change. Accept that you can be wrong. Try not to be so radically consistent all the time we are all evolving all changing all the time sort of be kind to yourself in terms of like your own errors of of cognition or whatever i think we could do a similar kind of thing here um and one of the things i think is super important is that message tailoring is um you know should be as much as possible trying to reach individual or smaller and smaller kind of segments of a given audience right if you're trying to tailor a message to literally everyone you have to go up and up and out and out in terms of like the generality that you're speaking at because you're trying to cover more and more of the population which means you got to include more and more in the message and you have to get out anything that can like sway one group against another or come across as overly this or overly that so it tends to get kind of like watered down i think right so Think about your own reactions to messages. It's like, this doesn't apply to me. This has nothing to do with me. But if something's hitting you right where you live and it's finding your sweet spot, things you care about, things you value, then you're going to be more attentive likely, right? And so that message is important all the way throughout is to try as, as 
as much as possibly sensitive to your audience in the most granular possible way. Um, and making sure your message is being kind of custom tailored to the t tiniest group that you can, you know, uh, with confidence gauge your uh, ability to reach. So there's good stuff there. And then we get into all the examples, which I'm actually going to kind of bounce over. Um, although there is an important note on page 339, this business of unintended effects, right? So point number eight here is about the unintended consequences. Um, it may have unwittingly increased mistrust or suspicion of unorthodox but hardly criminal individuals. So if you're trying to get tough on crime and you're trying to get people to be more attentive and alert and aware, that's maybe a good thing. But you can also maybe tip things over into paranoia and finding fault where it doesn't belong. And so we can kind of go in the other direction, right? I feel like something similar might have happened with masks where like masks are a good idea but then they also there's this unintended consequence of like now we're too attached to our masks or now we hate them in with a passion and everything kind of got very divided on masks for some strange reason but point is is it's very hard to gauge how something's going to land and then what the kind of ripple effects might be or the knock-on effects of a given campaign um and we can never predict with certainty we never can but we can try our best to anticipate we can try our best to kind of think about implications and what might be a response and then maybe we can inoculate against those things right all right um number nine there we do get a brief mention of structural barriers um which is probably more important than this chapter makes it out this is uh 12 years ago this book was published so um, we've had a lot of talk of structures and structural kind of impediments and obstacles. Um, and my guess is that earlier or more recent versions of this book would probably spend even more time talking that through. But think about things like time and mobility and access to the kinds of agencies and resources that one might need, right? Think about education. Think about health. Think about, you know, ability. And we have a lot of structural challenges surrounding those questions and so those things can get in the way of even the most artful persuasive campaign and somewhere in here he says even attitudes can't change behavior if there are structural impediments getting in the way of your ability to change that behavior you might want to do something but you can't because you don't have the other components necessary to do it right um so that's important yep complicating factors so 10 and 10 and 11 kind of gets to this question of social and cultural values and political values in a broad sense where are we here 352 ish um, complicating factors is about social cultural and historical complexity campaigns fail when they f face daunting social or political obstacles um, deep-seated values prejudices um, reactions that kick in because of circumstances that change that we might not have anticipated right um, and on and on. So we end off thinking about values and um, it's important and probably more important than the few pages that it's given. But values, think about some values, right? Privacy, safety, comfort, pleasure, um, speed, uh, convenience, affordability, health, vitality, um uh, does you know attractive on and on and on these things are so deep within us they inform really everything we do and so whenever we're talking about campaigns and pro-social messaging we're already talking about values and oftentimes what we're doing is we're trying to move attitudes away from certain values and toward other values but it's important to be thinking about audience values and again and if you're trying to reach them if you're trying to get them to value quality over quantity you first got to start with their investment in quantity right and then you got to sort of maybe show them that an obsessive addiction to quantity over quality means that we all kind of suffer because you know we have to buy things more regularly we have to throw them out it contributes to trash um, no one really benefits but if we're focused on quality then we spend fewer you know dollars over time we're getting a better more satisfying experience whatever right but again values are underneath all that okay this is 35 minutes which is a long single video but 
it's only 35 minutes for the whole week and I tried to go as quickly as I could just hitting the really interesting and compelling and, and relevant stuff for our purposes here but again we're talking about strategic deliberate attempts to get as many people as possible to accept new pro-social ideas values and behaviors and we've got some good stuff in here in terms of the how of doing that and what are some of the um, points of resistance and what are some of the complex factors that are involved in that so there we go for uh, this topic this week and then we'll see you in another week talking about social movements so hope everyone's well